seen it. I hadn't seen it. Uh, but I believe it's there. Hey. That's faith. Amen. Amen. The just shall live by faith. I believe it because he said so. Hey. Amen. Amen. Because he said, you know, we can rejoice because our names are recorded in heaven. Written hey. in heaven. Amen. Think about that. Your name. Hey. In the book of, of heaven. God. Amen. Amen. What a blessing. What a blessing to be saved and to know you're on the guest roll. Amen. In the family book. Amen. That's right. That's right. Amen. If I was to come over to Brother Speed's house, I wouldn't expect to see my face anywhere in those pictures among his family. With his brothers and sisters and mom and dad and mm -hmm. aunts and uncles and cousins. Uh, I you probably wouldn't see me right in the mix, no, no time at all. And that's because I'm not in the Hunter family. But we're in the family of God together. Amen. 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 You can expect to find your name Amen. there. Amen. Sang for us. Somebody else may want to come sing. You better do that one from earlier today. say that every time, but I really mean it. Amen. Thank the Lord for them.
good God is. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. I just enjoyed that song. Enjoyed them singing. Amen. Amen. All right. Anybody else got anything on your heart this evening? Before Brother Jordan comes. All right. Brother, you come. Bring the message, okay? Some more. That song is a real blessing to me every time I hear it. Hey. It says, you know, through all your sorrows, you know. I've had many sorrows, you know, but I've never had to worry about him never being in my tomorrow. Hey. I've never had to worry about his his presence never leaving me. Hey. You know, even when I've been worried about things, you know, I know I shouldn't worry, but you know, it's a sign of lack of faith because God's got it all in our in his hand. Hey. You know, he's hey. got all of us. You know, and that's that's amazing, hey. you know, just to think about. But uh, pray for me as I preach. This has Amen. kind of been on my heart, and this has been in my personal devotions ever since last year, really. And uh, as I come to grips with a lot of things, you know, and a lot of, you know, really a lot of really catching up with what spiritual wisdom is, to be honest. Hey. Because honestly, I grew up in church my whole life, and I didn't know a whole lot, even though I was sat under the most sound preaching you've ever yes, been sir. under, it never hits you quite real until it actually slaps you in the face with life's issues and problems, you know. Yeah. And you realize what God has really done for you and where you come from. Amen. But I'm going to start out in Genesis chapter 4. And just the title and the message on my heart. And you'll start to understand why as it comes to come all around. But what I'm going to be preaching on is what are we doing here? And we, through this message, we're going to talk about some people that have had moments of what am I doing here? And what are we doing here? What are we going to do going forward? And honestly, I've had many moments like that, and those are making and breaking moments because those are decisions that you either cut the wrong wire or you get the right wire. And if you're not walking with God, you're going to cut the wrong wire. And we'll see in this this chapter right here, the man who cut the wrong wire. Mm -hmm. We're going to start in verse 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and the fact thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel. To his offering. But unto Cain, to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shalt be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field. And Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And thou art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her blood to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out from this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any man find him should kill him. So we see Cain obviously did wrong. And this is a sin of not only anger, but the way of religion. Cain went by works. He did not go by what was spiritual. He did not, he was not a spiritual leaning man. As you can see, his anger, when he became wrong, chose to do some very wicked things that no, I could never imagine doing. But to be honest, I've come close, I would think. Because anger is a rather damaging thing to a person's mind. It'll, hey. be, it'll, 
They'll make you get irrational. Right. They'll make you not think about what you're doing. Before you know it, you've already hurt someone you love. Right. And no going back. You can't take that away. You can only ask for forgiveness. Right. And God wanted King's forgiveness. God asked him, what hast thou done? But right before that, when the Lord asked Cain, where is Abel thy brother? He chose to lie to God. And that's what relig false religion does to God. We like to, they like to take the Bible, and they like to twist it and lie with it. They don't want to acknowledge the truth. We've heard a lot talk about it from Brother Mark this morning, about people twisting the word of God to fit what they want. That's no different than what Cain was doing. He was trying to go by works, though, his own works. And we are, we're not bought by works. It's by the blood of Christ, we are And I think Abel, he understood this because of the sacrifice that his family had passed down from him, the knowledge that there would be one day a Savior, and a sacrifice would be made. And, Cain, and Abel knew that for a sacrifice to be paid, it would have to be a sinless son of God, which is is a symbolism of this sheep that he brought, spotless and pure and young, before it's time to come to give up because it was under our sins it was done. That was why the time had to come so short. But Cain refused to see this. He refused so much, so vehemently, that when God approached him with what was his consequences, instead of Cain getting right with God, he said, I can't handle this. No, God, no, -uh, no, -uh, no. I can't do this. This is too much. I will be dead before morning. That's not a way to approach God. When we commit sin, the first thing we ought to do is to fall on our face and understand what we have truly done to God. Because we have done it in God's eyes. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is ever a secret in God. God is, honestly, as I'm looking at everyone now, God is looking at you even closer because he sees your heart. Right. He sees your soul. Hey. And he knows everything about you. And for us to reject the forgiveness of God so vehemently, not even to think about asking forgiveness, Cain was so set in his way that that was what he was going to do. He decided that he would leave the presence of God, which he was sent from because he would not repent. If you look in verse 16, it says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. It's a terrible thing to leave the presence of God. Right. That is when the most danger, that is when the most of your life will be flipped upside down. Mm -hmm. And I've seen preachers, mm -hmm. I've seen ministers that were powerful, that were well used by God, yeah. fall to something I thought was impossible for them to fall. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about my heroes of the faith. And I watch them, and I come away asking why God, why? <clears throat> And I come to this, and I'm like, they left the presence of God. Hey, mm. We have to choose to stay in the presence of God every single action we do, every decision, because that is what our convictions are based on, and that's what the Scripture is based upon. We go by what Scripture says, not what we want to think. Hey, right, right. But this was a moment for Cain, and Cain chose wrong. And when he was asked what he's doing, he decided it wasn't that bad. And why was he supposed to take care of Abel? It was his kind of mentality. But we have a better outlook to look at. Someone else. Someone who came to a moment not quite like this, but very similar. And I want to go to 1 Kings 19. We're going to talk about Elijah. Elijah is one of my heroes of the Bible. Hey. Because every time I read about him, I see a little bit of myself in him. But... You're so much of a mighty man of God that was so used. You find in many areas of his life, he was tempted. In this chapter, we're going to read about, he comes off of a great big win with the challenge of Baal's prophets, where fire was called down from heaven when he prayed unto God and asked hey. for it. He came off such an incredible win in the eyes of men. In the eyes of really anyone looking on him that had any idea and standing of what God's moving was. But we'll start in verse 1 to really understand kind of the setting after the whole dueling of all the prophets of Baal against Elijah. 
And the verse one reads, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Mm -hmm. And as he lay and slept on a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. Hey. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink, and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of the meat forty days and four nights on the Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto the cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? We see Elijah come from this moment of this such, such a, such a moment of just distress, such a moment of really just something that he comes to terms with that he he couldn't face anymore. He wanted to quit. He wanted to. Give up. He couldn't take it anymore. He thought everyone had been gone. But all he had left was God, you know. But that's what Cain had. Cain was able to talk one on one with God. You know, Cain did Cain gave up. He didn't ask for forgiveness. You know, Elijah here, Elijah pretty much gave up. He said, God, I can't do this anymore. I, I don't, I'm not better than my father's. I'm not a better man than my dad. How can I go on knowing that I failed so, so badly? And that was just how he came. He just came from a great battle. And I'll tell you this one thing that I've learned. Whenever you've crossed, you've gotten on top of the mountaintop of your life, there will come a moment where you'll hit the worst valley you'll ever go through. I've gone on the biggest highs I've ever had. And in my day, get the worst news I've ever had. And I felt so broken and horrible. Or something happened and I wasn't prepared for it. Or some, God forbid, somehow I lose my temper and I snap at someone or I sin. But there's always a way back to God. Hey, As long as you choose to acknowledge what you've become. That you have sin and what you are. We are not... We are sinners saved by grace. Hey, Most of us right. saved here. We have the grace of God given. There is mercy. But sometimes we choose not to get that mercy. You see Elijah here with, in verse 3. When he arose and went for his life and came to Sheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. God provides many uses for us for companionship for a fellowship and for help. We oftentimes, I know I do, I have people that I go to, that I talk to, that I can pour my heart to, and that can help minister to me, that can help my heart. Amen. And when he left that servant there, he left the one person that could minister him that was left in his eyes. And that's when he became so low. He let his worry in his confusion, take the best of him and left the only help humanly possible for him. And we tend to do that. We tend to do that to our companions, our relationships, husbands, wives, families even, kids to their parents. Things happen. You don't communicate to your spouse. You don't communicate in what happens. You push them away. Uh, that's what Cain did. He didn't want to communicate with God. He most certainly wasn't going to communicate with someone that was living right. He saw Abel as nothing but what he should be for God, but what he would not be. Cain would refuse and would not be what Cain wanted was for God. 
And that's a sad thing because I see many people, many young people that have so much potential. I've seen preachers with so much power, so much gift from God on them. The hand of God just, you can see it magnified from the pulpit. And them give up everything. For a woman, for beer, for drugs, I've seen it. And it's, it makes me worry and fear for my friends. And if you're not careful, that's what it will come to. If you don't make the right decisions, you're not right with God, you're not walking with God, you're not reading this Bible, having the relationship with God you ought to have, you're going to make the wrong decisions. Hey. And that's just a matter of fact. When we're not walking with God, our other areas of life are not going to be right because we're hey. not seeking God for his Amen. will. But it doesn't end there for Elijah. Elijah goes on in verse 10. And he, Elijah said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. He said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. Behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind passed by, and a great and strong wind. <laughs> You know, God, God will provide, he will give you the peace in those moments when you want to give hey. up. He'll give you a picture of his power and what he can do, but you have to get to the point where you can see that. Because we like to look back in our past, we like to see the moments where we have failed, and we like to see the moments where people have wronged us, or when we're lonely. We like to rather look at that more than when God has been with us the most, when we've had the most love we can take, when we've had the best moments of our lives. But we overlook it. We don't want to look at those things. We choose to look at the bad. But Elijah here, when God told him to go and look at the good things that he was going to do with this picture of his power and what he can do for him, you know, to protect him. Elijah went to the place he needed to go. And we'll continue reading verse 11. And a great, strong, a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after fire a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice from him and said, what doest thou here, Elijah? God does not. Those are mighty acts, you know, but just happen around him. But God doesn't always deal with those in those ways. Sometimes we have those moments of the burning bush in front of us where it's so clear what the will of God is. But then we have the still small voice that will come and comfort us. Hey, and will give, just give us what we need to go on. And I've been in those moments where I wanted to give up. I just couldn't. I felt like I couldn't go on. But then a still small voice comes. And I just hear God say, keep on, boy. Hey. Keep on. My love is enough for you, son. You can do it. Amen. And without those moments, I wouldn't know truly what the love of God is. Right. Because in those moments, I get to compassion and the care you know from God right. just to keep on going it's another step and another step and that's what happens when we don't communicate is we don't get the help we need that's right. when we're not praying to God when we're not communicating with our spouse you're not with your significant other that's what happens they don't know what to do to help you they can't fix what's the problem right. and that's what we do to God though <laughs> God is right there with the help we need. Hey. But we refuse to talk to him, right. to ask for God help. help. Right. And I've done it so many times where I've just needed help from God, and I refuse to ask. Mm -hmm. And I think we all have in every area of our life almost. Amen. But the still small voice comes and asks Elijah, what are you doing here? I think he just wanted Elijah to know what he was doing here. 
God already knew why he was there. He wanted Elijah to know what he's doing. Because God can take him from what that was. And he knows God is better than that. Just like they were singing, he's good like that. God can take you from anywhere you are. And then uplift you to a spot where you can be used of God. Right. You know, it doesn't have to end here in a cave with Elijah. Asking for God to take him out. If you just listen to the small voice, to the love of God calling you, give, wanting to give you that help, you can get that help tonight. And if you're lost and God is talking to you, you can get saved. You can get that help. There's a hole inside a soul that only God can fill. Hey. Uh, and I spent a lot of different ways trying to fill that hole when I was lost. I remember being so depressed and so sad, feeling so lonely. Felt like I was forgotten and that no one cared until God opened up my eyes, you know, in many different years of my life before and protecting me. Giving me people that would love me and just opening my eyes little by little to help soften my hard heart. Because I had hardened it so much to the things of God. I looked at preaching as a target because I saw everything my parents went through. And I told God I will never do that. And look what God has done. But, <laughs> but honestly, I wouldn't change it for the world. The calling of God is such a tremendous responsibility. Hey. And I worry that I might be a failure when it comes to it. And that's a massive responsibility. To speak the word of God, to get up, to preach to others what God's heart is. That's a massive responsibility. Yeah. And I don't ever want to fail it. But God has always been there for us. You know, even if when we do fail him, he comes to us. Just with a still small voice, wants to patch things up. Hey. No matter what you've done, you can still get back with God in His good eyes and good graces and be one of His children. And you'll never ever cast out. But our trials, they not only help strengthen us, they help others. If we skip down to. Verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshai, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, shalt thou anoint to be the prophet in thy, in thy room. And came to pass that him that escaped the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay. And him that escaped the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed on the bale, and every mouth which hath not kissed them. So he departed thence, and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with the twelve yoke of oxen before him. He with the twelve, and Elijah passed by him, and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and mother, and I will follow thee. And he said unto them, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave the people, gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. But we see because Elijah didn't quit that we have another one a next generation that's going to step up into Elijah's place. We have Elisha. And when an opportunity was given to Elisha to step up and to take that mantle, Elijah didn't tell him to take the mantle. You'll see it there. Elijah said, go back again, but what have I done to thee? That wasn't Elijah's calling to give. It was God. When the mantle fell, when he cast the mantle upon him, that was God's calling to Elisha. Yeah. And it was a calling for Elisha to leave all that he had and follow after God and to become what Elijah was. And that you see it throughout Elisha's life. When I read it, it's almost like a fatherhood and a, a son. He treats Elijah almost like his dad. 
it's very much like God gave him everything he needed. He left his family but gave him someone else, a companion. And God will do that for you. As you see Elijah, that Elijah, he rose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. That was the help they both needed. God gives you the people you need to help you. Don't push them away. If I was to push away Millie here, and we're recording, if I was to push her away, if I'm having some type of hardship, that would not be the right thing to do. Because we're supposed to bear each other's burdens. And when I push away my help, that doesn't do anything but strain my own heart because I'm not choosing to get the help I need. But when we both come together and we share each other's burdens, and we pour out our hearts to each other, it helps so much the more because then you have that extra voice coming to you, telling you you can do it. You know, I'm here and God is with us. And when you have that unity, there's nothing like it. And you can keep on going. And that's what we see here with Elisha and Elijah. And I, I love Elisha's life and his ministry. It's such an, it's such an awesome thing to see. Because we were left with a sense of awe and wonder. Because Elisha chose this life. And we can go. I'm just going to turn over to 2 Kings. Uh, 2 Kings. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. No. <clears throat> Let me think a little bit. Forgive me, I need a little bit. I don't know, I lost my place. Okay. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 2. Alright. We'll start in verse 1 because I think it gives the context needed to understand everything that's going to happen when Elijah just goes up into heaven. But. We'll continue reading in verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went from Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent thee to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy hand to today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold you your peace. And Elijah said to them, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee. For the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold you your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here. For the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters that they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what? I shall do for thee, before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon thee. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Hey. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. He took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah 
that fell from them, and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and smote the waters, and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he, had, when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him, and bowed themselves to the ground before him. So we see, many times, Elijah told Elisha, Stay here. I'm going far off. Stay here. It's, you stay here. He did it three times. I believe it was a testing of Elisha to see if he had if he was going to stick with the stuff. Because we see in each place there's prophets in each of these cities, but they don't follow. It. They stay. But you see Elisha keep going and going and going, and then he's they cross Jordan together. But the prophets, the sons of the prophets, these are people that were raised under people like Elijah. The sons of those people. Why didn't they follow? They obviously knew Elijah had such a great standing with God. They saw, they recognized his spirit on Elisha. What, why, why, and what could have been the reason they didn't go forward and follow him? Because it was their choice. Elisha made his choice up. The other prophets knew Elijah was going to be taken from them. Elijah knew it. They kept trying to dismay him, and that's what the world's going to do. They're going to try to pull you back, try to stop you. And every turn you make, every stop you get to, every, every milestone you get to, every high in your life that you'll ever have in your Christian walk with God, it's going to become a time where they're going to be, oh, but you know this is going to happen with that when you do that, right? That's what's going to happen. And then you have to make the choice to, I know this is going to be a hard thing, but I'm going to do it. i got to keep going. I have to keep going and going and going. But we not only see that, but Elisha had the passion to keep going on. When he's asked by Elijah what, what he wanted when he would be taken away, Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And Elijah said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I'm taken away, so shall it be unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. There's a passion in Elisha to be just like Elijah, <coughs> but to go even further, to keep going further than Elijah, to do more than Elijah. Elijah was Elisha's hero. And if I could put this in the terms of my heroes of faith, I think my dad is probably the greatest hero I've ever had in my life. If I ever be half the man he is, I'd be satisfied. But if what I want and what I'm satisfied with are two different things. I want to be more than my dad. I want to go further than my dad. I want to see things never done before in my life, in his life. I want to see things, I want to see the earth shake with God's might. I want to see things that my dad's not seen. And you know, Elisha had a passion for God. He knew what he was asking. Wow. Elisha knew what hard times would come. He knew what would happen when he got to this point, I believe. Because he was so ready and so prepared with what he wanted. I believe he knew what he wanted as he followed Elijah. That moment that mantle fell. And Elijah said, go back again. What have I done? That was Elisha's moment where he chose, this is what I want. Right. And this is what I'm going to do. But Cain chose not. <clears throat> We have these two polar opposites, but two different decisions and two different lifestyles. We can look at different people like David that have sinned so badly against God, committed adultery, murder, and they get so depressed. 
on their face before God and weep bitterly for days and days and days and days. But their story never ends there. <clears throat> because what we are, we can fail many times. It's not an excuse to fail or to sin. <clears throat> but it's forgiveness. I mean, it's grace. Grace to go forward, to do more. Because David didn't end there. He could have just said, you know what, I'm done. I've sinned so horribly. I don't deserve to do anything else for God like Elijah did. But he didn't. David said, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do it. I'm going to change. I'm going to be what I want my relationship with God to be. I want it to go further. And I want my son's life to go further than mine. He prepared the temple of God for his son. He couldn't build the temple because of his sin. But he sure could prepare it. And he, that's what David did. He prepared everything Solomon would ever need in his life for the temple of God to be made. He didn't prepare for schooling, although I'm sure he was prepared being the king's son. He didn't prepare him for how the cultures would be dealing with different nations. He prepared him for the things of God. What are we doing? Are we preparing the next generation for God? As we see Elijah doing just that. Elijah had such strength after coming down from that. I don't know if I see him ever have anything like that ever again from what I've read. Though. I believe his strength was so fast in God, steadfast in God. I think it rubbed off on Elisha. And Elisha was like, I want that. And I've had moments in my life where I've looked at my heroes and I've said, I want that, but I want more. And then I feel in my heart, do you know what you're asking? Because that's, you know, honestly, sometimes it comes as like a fear of mine. Because when God called me to preach, I knew it was the will of God. But for like four days, I ran from God because I did not want that yet. I knew I would want it, but I knew at that point in time, I wasn't, I didn't know what responsibility I would have. And I didn't want it. And after I took time to reflect and to pray and to seek God, God gave me peace. And I came to terms with it. And God just spoke in a still, small voice at one of the services that night. And the preacher, I'll never forget, he was preaching about what you want in life. And he was preaching on the life of Solomon. And when he prayed for wisdom and understanding and the ways that he was able to walk, I went to the altar and I prayed, God, I'm sorry for how I've acted and how I've treated your home. But God, I want this now. I want to go further, Lord. I want to do things for you. I want to I want to serve. Hey. And in my heart, in my heart, you know. That fire is not ended. I still want to do more. But then back of my head, I still always have the voices of, oh, you know what you're going to do when you get to this point, right? You know how hard it's going to be, you know, once you get to that city, once you get to that milestone in life, you know? What you going to do when God calls you to be a missionary? What you going to do when God calls you to be an evangelist? And I've told myself, and in my heart, I've come to peace with it, you know? Since then, I'm ready for it. Should God call me, I'm ready for it. I would love to do any of those things when I'm called. I want to be prepared for those things. And being prepared is something Elisha was doing. Elisha saw where things were heading. He saw that they were heading over to Jordan. And he knew what was going to happen, where he'd have to find out what he really, really wanted. And then ask for it. In this life, we don't look at the things of God for what we want. We don't even look at what's right with God. We don't look at our potential. We don't look at what we could be for God. We, we ask ourselves, we get to that question, what are we doing? And what are we going to do? And those are the most crucial questions you'll ask yourself. Because you'll either walk with God or you'll do something you'll regret.
and you'll live a life of misery. And for the most part, I've seen lives make the right decisions, and they've had hardships. It doesn't come with ease. But I see the joy on their face. I see the hand of God on them. And I see the souls being saved. And I just tell myself, I want that, God. I want to do that. You know, that song they sang, he's good like that. It takes a lot to say it. But when you have the faith, you can say, I know you're going to be good like that when I get to this point. And so you keep going. You keep going. You keep going. And you know, People like Elijah and Elisha are people we should love to live. Not our own heroes of this world, not the sports stars, not any of the actors or actresses. We should uplift our own role models and heroes of the faith and God's word. Hey, as many times we don't make the right decisions, and I've seen so many of my friends make the wrong decision. And that's all I want for the people of God is right decisions and to see them grow. And I've seen so many people in here grow already. The wee kids that we're seeing, I remember when they were just, you know, short. I remember when they couldn't play piano. When they were kind of bashful when they got up to sing, you know? And now I see them over there serving God. It does my heart joy. It blesses my heart. You know, I see people, and I see children in churches and I'll see them sing, but sometimes the spirit's not there in them. And when I can see the spirit in them, it does my heart good, because I know there's others just like me that are keep going with this stuff. They're gonna keep going. And I pray nothing ever happens. And I hope that was a help. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.